Hi, everyone. Today, we're talking about the possibility for life on Enceladus. So for the general outline of this video, we'll go over first what Enceladus is. Then we'll talk about Enceladus's habitability, basically whether it contains the three main constituents needed for life, which is water, the chinops elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and energy for life. And then we'll talk about the origin of life and the importance of origin of life events and our understanding of them for understanding whether Enceladus has the potential to be both habitable and and inhabited or just habitable but not necessarily inhabited because they are two separate things that are separated by a major lack of understanding of origin of life events so we'll talk about that and what we do understand and then we'll talk about the importance of studying earth and earth's origin of life in that context and then lastly we'll try and answer the questions of what if we find life on enceladus and what if we don't basically what kind of implications would that have for future science so first what is Enceladus? Well, Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. We've talked about in this astrobiology planetary geology playlist on my channel, some other icy moons similar to Enceladus, such as Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter. But Enceladus is the first moon of Saturn that we'll be discussing. And Enceladus has a rocky core. It's ice covered, just like Europa. It has a liquid water ocean underneath its ice cover, just like Europa again. But something that Enceladus has that Europa does does not have are plumes of material that extrude out the south polar region of the icy crust of Enceladus. And the reason for these plumes is likely hydrothermal vent activity in the underlying ocean. However, Europa likely has hydrothermal vent activity at the bottom of its ocean where it comes in contact with its rocky interior. But what Europa doesn't have, to our knowledge at present, is any breaching of material at the surface surface of the icy crust, whereas Enceladus has all these great plumes where it releases material to space where we can actually capture it and analyze it, which is really cool. And we have done that, and I'll talk about that on this slide. So Enceladus, like we just mentioned, has hydrothermal vents where water-rock interactions provide the necessary nutrients for life. So if we look at this triangle down here that we had in the first Europa video about the possibility for life on your Europa, we talked about how the three main essentials for life as we know it are water, the chinops elements, like I mentioned earlier, and energy. Because for life on Earth, we know that those are three essentials. And like we mentioned in the Europa video, Europa has all those three things and therefore is classified as habitable. And Enceladus also has these three things and is also habitable, at least, you know, in its ocean where the hydrothermal vents are providing these chinops elements, the energy, and obviously it's in water. So there you go. And when we look at Enceladus's plumes and the composition of the plumes as analogous to its ocean's composition, we can get an understanding for maybe how the chemistry of Enceladus's ocean might promote life. And so far, what we've found in the plumes indicate that methanogenesis, a metabolic pathway of microbes that produce methane, seems like it's the most likely type of metabolism to exist in any life that might be present on Enceladus. Why do we think methanogenesis is most likely, and how might this work in Enceladus's ocean? So the reason why we think methanogenesis is likely is because the plume material we analyzed was found to contain molecular hydrogen, carbon dioxide, methane, and other organics. And this finding indicates to us that two of the major constituents found in the plume are actually a known metabolic redox pair. What does this mean? Well, they produce a redox reaction from which microbes can gain energy. This reaction uses carbon dioxide as the oxidant and molecular hydrogen as the reductant, which reduces the carbon in the carbon dioxide to methane, and the energy from this reaction can be harnessed by methanogenic microbes, which if present in Enceladus's ocean would be producing methane from that molecular hydrogen and carbon dioxide, and it just so happens that methane was also found in the blue material. So this makes perfect sense and could be a viable metabolic pathway that's occurring on Enceladus as we speak. 
But unlike on Earth, there aren't any other microbes, to our knowledge, on Enceladus that can reoxidize the methane back to carbon dioxide to allow this process to occur again and again. What would happen without the other microbes around to oxidize that carbon back to carbon dioxide is that eventually all the carbon dioxide would eventually be converted to methane and used up and no longer available to support methanogenesis. So the question is, how do these microbes get the ox for their red? <laughs> and I just mean that there are no oxidizing microbes to balance out their reducing metabolism. So how do we get the ox for the red to make a redox cycle of metabolizing microbes? Well, it turns out that abiotic oxidation of the reduced products, aka methane, could occur at the hydrothermal vents on Enceladus, providing new oxidants for the microbes to reduce, aka carbon dioxide. And this just means that water flowing through the subsurface could regenerate molecular hydrogen carbon dioxide from the methane in water, basically the opposite reaction to the methanogenesis metabolism, if temperatures are high enough to support such a reaction. Because obviously, if this direction direction of the reaction creates energy, the other direction requires energy. So if the temperatures are high enough for water circulation through the subsurface to regenerate the carbon dioxide, that could be a viable way that the microbes could continue to use it up and it continues to be produced and then it's cyclic and it works and they don't run out. This would mean that methanogens could be the primary producers on Enceladus. But methane production could also be abiotically produced. So how can we determine whether Enceladus's methane is biogenic or abiotic? Well, a recent paper published in 2021 developed models to determine the most likely of three scenarios. These three scenarios they used in their simulations of their models include a biotic scenario in which Enceladus's ocean is both habitable and inhabited by methanogens, which at least in part contribute to the methane production on Enceladus, and then an abiotic habitable scenario in which the ocean on Enceladus is habitable, but the methane produced is fully abiotic and there are not any methanogens contributing to the production of methane on Enceladus. And then the third scenario, which is fully abiotic in which not only is there no methanogens producing any methane, it is all abiotic, but also it's an inhabitable scenario. So these were the three scenarios they tested out of over 50,000 simulations in their model, which is based on what we know about the chemistry and physics of Enceladus's ocean to date. And what they found is the probability of a biotic scenario on Enceladus is most likely, which is really exciting, but there is a catch. This finding is assuming that the probability for an origin of life event under habitable conditions is greater than around 0.35. And we have to make this assumption because we actually don't know what the probability for an origin of life event is under habitable conditions, because we don't know enough about origin of life events. We don't even know a lot about the origin of life on Earth, but I'll talk about that later in the video. This finding is still positive, though, because given that the probability of an origin of life event only has to be 0.35, less than half, for a biotic scenario to be most likely on Enceladus, that means that a biologically active of Enceladus is likely, even if the prebiotic chemistry on Enceladus is or was less than favorable for an origin of life event. And the main takeaway from this is that methanogens could be present and living on Enceladus right now, which is really cool. But this finding all hinges on the likelihood of an origin of life event, which brings us to our discussion over the origin of life on Enceladus. Like I mentioned earlier, just because a world is habitable does not mean it's inhabited, which was emphasized by our three scenarios. Habitable was separated from inhabited. However, on Earth, you might think this doesn't seem to be the case, and that's totally true. It seems that almost any environment remotely habitable on Earth is for sure inhabited, even if we don't think that it should be. And we can see some examples of really extreme environments over here to the right. But the life that we have on Earth already exists and can adapt and evolve to be able to inhabit those extreme types of environments but this life had to have had an origin, and that is the hard part. 
I have a whole separate video where I discuss the current understanding of the origin of life on Earth and how biological molecules may have been abiotically synthesized, but you can watch that if you want to know more about the nitty gritty chemical and biochemical details. But here, let's talk about what we can draw in terms of hypotheses we can make about Enceladus's origin of life based on what we understand about Earth's origin of life. And here we can see Earth's origin of life isn't really fully understood. In fact, it's very poorly understood. We know roughly when the origin of life on Earth occurred. It occurred from between 4.5 to 3.5 billion years ago. And we just know this because we know that at 3.5 billion years ago, we have unequivocal evidence for life on Earth. And at 4.5 billion years ago, Earth just formed. So that's kind of the most constrained we can get right now with our understanding of when it occurred, which is not very well constrained. But we also don't know how it occurred, where it occurred, or how long it took to occur. So we can judge whether an environment can support life as we know it, aka whether it's habitable, because life as we know it has three essential needs, and that is water, the chinops elements, and energy, as we mentioned earlier. And using these things to judge Enceladus, we know, yeah, it's pretty habitable. But what we can't judge is whether an environment can support an origin of life event. And that's the limiting factor when it comes to developing these types of models that predict a biotic or abiotic scenario on Enceladus. So what kind of info can we get about an origin of life event on Enceladus from our limited knowledge of Earth's origin of life? Like on Earth, we know that life could have arose from two major ways on Enceladus. These include a local origin or the transfer of life, otherwise known as the panspermia hypothesis. Panspermia has not been thoroughly investigated, but cannot be ruled out. And if it did occur, there might be a common biochemistry across the solar system because the transfer of life occurred from one planet to another. Who knows where the origin might have occurred first? But this would also pose problems because if we did discover similar biochemistry on Enceladus or other worlds in the solar system, we might not be able to distinguish that from a panspermia scenario versus contamination from our own planet. So it's a possibility. It hasn't been thoroughly investigated. It'd be really hard to distinguish from contamination. But in this video, we're just going to focus on a local origin of life event because that's what we think occurred on Earth and may have occurred on Enceladus. So on Earth, we know that a local origin of life might have occurred at either alkaline hydrothermal vents similar to those on Enceladus. But some scientists think that an origin of life event would have to have wet and dry cycles. In other words, it would have to have been on land. This is 100% possible on Earth. We know from the origin of life video I did, I talked about the two major hypotheses for the origin of life on Earth being either a warm little pond, aka on land with wet and dry cycles, or a hydrothermal vent. But the two scenarios are not possible on ice-covered ocean worlds like Enceladus, Europa, etc. The only possibility for those types of worlds would be the hydrothermal vent possibility. So if we can constrain where the origin of life on Earth occurred, in other words, if we can rule out or rule in the possibility of origin of life occurring at hydrothermal vents, we'd be able to predict with a lot more certainty whether Enceladus could have life or even other icy moons. Another unknown is the age of Enceladus and the persistence of its ocean. And like I said, the only thing we know about how long the origin of life on Earth took is that it had to have taken place between 4.5 and 3.5 billion years ago. And as you can see down here by the geologic time scale, which represents all of Earth history, this is a pretty large chunk of Earth history that is the range in which we know the origin of life had to have occurred. And if we can narrow that range down, and understand exactly how long the origin of life on Earth took, then that will help us greatly in understanding how old Enceladus must be for being able to host life. And maybe if it's not that old, we might be able to look for prebiotic chemistry on Enceladus that could eventually lead to an origin of life rather than looking for well-established life. So understanding how long an origin of life takes is really important as well. 
So to recap our lack of knowledge regarding the where, the how, and the how long of origin of life events, even on Earth, prevents us from estimating the probability of life elsewhere with any certainty. So we cannot say whether the search for life on Enceladus will be successful, but whether we find life or we don't, the findings of such a mission will provide very important insight into a second data point for origin of life events. What I mean by this is that Earth is our only origin of life data point to date because Earth is the only thing that we know life exists on. And so it's the only planetary body or moon to our knowledge that has life and therefore has had an origin of life event. If we were to gain a second data point, whether it be for not having an origin of life, but being habitable, or having an origin of life and being habitable, it would be very helpful. So that just means if you didn't understand that, whether we find life or find definitive proof that there is not life on Enceladus, that is very helpful for our understanding and our data regarding origin of life events and can actually help us understanding Earth. And what that means is that studying Earth such as the origin of life event on Earth, will very much help us predicting life on other worlds, but it goes the other way too. Looking for life on other worlds will also help us understand the origin of life on Earth. So I was gonna continue in this video and also talk about Earth analogs to environments on Enceladus, but since I didn't wanna make this too long, I am going to include that in the upcoming video, which here you can see is similarities between Earth and Enceladus. We'll talk about analogs to Enceladus that we can find on Earth and study to predict biology and conditions on Enceladus. And we'll also in that video talk about how we should go about detecting life on Enceladus and other worlds. And then in another upcoming Enceladus video, we'll talk about Enceladus's plumes in a little bit more detail and how they work and stuff. And if you want to check out the major reference I'm using to make this video, it is the book titled Enceladus and the Icy Moons of Saturn. And I'm also using, you guys know, one of my favorite books called Alien Oceans. I actually, I have the audio book, but I actually got the physical version because I love it so much. So I have both the audio and the physical book for this book. It's by Kevin Peter Hand. He's an amazing astrobiologist. Oh my God, you guys know I fangirl over him all the time. And so both of these are linked in my description as well as the papers I use, like that 2021 paper I used to talk about the models they made and all of that. So you guys can find those links in my description. And with that, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and look forward to the other Enceladus and astrobiology videos in this playlist. And thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.